The Dead Valley by Ralph Adams Cran. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Feaster. The Dead Valley I have a friend, Olaf Ernsvard, a Swede by birth, who yet by reason of a strange and melancholy mischance of his early boyhood has thrown his lot with that of the new world. It is a curious story, of a headstrong boy and a proud, relentless family. The details do not matter here, but they are sufficient to weave a web of romance around the tall, yellow-bearded man with the sad eyes and the voice that gives itself perfectly to plaintive little Swedish songs remembered out of childhood. In the winter evenings we play chess together, he and I, and after some close fierce battle has been fought to a finish, usually with my own defeat, we fill our pipes again, and Ernsvard tells me stories of the far half-remembered days in the fatherland, before he went to sea, stories that grow very strange and incredible as the night deepens and the fire falls together, but stories that, nevertheless, I fully believe. One of them made a strong impression on me, so I set it down here only regretting that I cannot reproduce the curiously perfect English and the delicate accent which, to me, increased the fascination of the tale, yet, as best as I can remember it, here it is. I've never told you how Niles and I went over the hills to Halsburg, and how we found the Dead Valley, did I? Well, this is the way it happened. I must have been about twelve years old, and Niles Soborg, whose father's estate joined ours, was a few months younger. We were inseparable just at that time, and whatever we did, we did together. Once a week it was market day in Ingleholm, and Niles and I went always there to see the strange sights that the market gathered from all the surrounding country. One day we quite lost our hearts, for an old man from across the Elfburg had brought a little dog to sell, that seemed to us the most beautiful dog in all the world. He was a round, woolly puppy, so funny that Niles and I sat down on the ground and laughed at him until he came and played with us in so jolly a way that we felt there was only one thing really desirable in life, and that was the little dog of the old man from across the hills. But alas, we had not half money enough for wherewithal to buy him, so we were forced to beg the old man not to sell him before the next market day, promising that we would bring the money for him then. He gave us his word, and we ran home very fast and employed our mothers to give us money for the little dog. We got the money, but could not wait for the next market day. Suppose the puppy should be sold. The thought frightened us so that we begged and implored that we might be allowed to go over the hills to Halsburg, where the old man lived, and get the little dog ourselves. And at last they told us we might go. By starting early in the morning we should reach Halsburg by three o'clock, and it was arranged that we should stay there that night with Niles' aunt, and, leaving by noon the next day, be home again by sunset. Soon after sunrise we were on our way, after having received minute instructions as to just what we should do in all possible and impossible circumstances, and finally a repeated injunction that we should start for home at the same hour the next day, so that we might get safely back before nightfall. For us it was magnificent sport, and we started off with our rifles, full of the sense of our very great importance. Yet the journey was simple enough, along a good road, across the big hills we knew so well, for Niles and I had shot over half the territory this side of the dividing ridge of the Elfburg. Back of Ingleholm lay a long valley from which rose the low mountains, and we had to cross this, and then follow the road along the side of the hills for three or four miles, before a narrow path branched off to the left, leading up through the pass. Nothing occurred of interest in the way over, and we reached Halsburg in due season, found to our inexpressible joy that the little dog was not sold, secured him, and so went to the house of Niles' aunt to spend the night. Why we did not leave early on the following day, I can't quite remember. At all events, I know we stopped at a shooting range just outside the town, where most attractive pasteboard pigs were sliding slowly through painted foliage, serving so as beautiful marks. The result was that we did not get fairly started for home until afternoon, and as we found ourselves at last pushing up the side of the mountain, with the sun dangerously near the summits, I think we were a little scared at the prospect of the examination and possible punishment that awaited us when we got home at midnight. Therefore we hurried as fast as possible up the mountainside, while the blue dusk closed in about us and the light died in the purple sky. At first we had talked hilariously, and the little dog had leapt ahead of us with the utmost joy. 
Latterly, however, a curious oppression came on us, and we did not speak or even whistle, while the dog fell behind, following us with hesitation in every muscle. We had passed through the foothills and the low spurs of the mountains, and were almost at the top of the main range, when life seemed to go out of everything, leaving the world dead, so suddenly silent the forest became, so stagnant the air. Instinctively, we halted to listen. Perfect silence, the crushing silence of deep forests at night, and more, for always, even in the most impenetrable fastness of the wooded mountains, is the multitudinous murmur of little lives awakened by the darkness, exaggerated and intensified by the stillness of the air and the great dark. But here and now the silence seemed unbroken, even by the turn of a leaf the movement of a twig, the note of night-bird or insect. I could hear the blood beat through my veins, and the crushing of the grass under our feet as we advanced with hesitating steps sounded like the falling of trees. And the air was stagnant, dead. The atmosphere seemed to lie upon the body like the weight of sea on a diver who has ventured too far into its awful depths. What we usually call silence seemed so only in relation to the din of ordinary experience. This was silence in the absolute, and it crushed the mind while it intensified the senses, bringing down the awful weight of inexhaustible fear. I know that Niles and I stared towards each other in abject terror, listening to our quick, heavy breathing that sounding in our acute senses like the fitful rush of waters, and the poor little dog we were leading justified our terror. The black oppression seemed to crush him even as it did us. He lay close to the ground, moaning feebly and dragging himself painfully and slowly closer to Niles' feet. I think this exhibition of utter animal fear was the last touch, and must inevitably have blasted our reason, mine anyway, but just then, as we stood quaking on the bounds of madness, came a sound so awful, so ghastly, so horrible, it seemed to rouse us from the dead spell that was on us. In the depths of the silence came a cry, beginning as a low, sorrowful moan, rising to a tremulous shriek, culminating in a yell that seemed to tear the night in sunder and rend the world as by cataclysm. So fearful was it that I could not believe it had actual existence. It passed previous experience, the powers of belief, and for a moment I thought it the result of my own animal terror, a hallucination born of tottering reason. A glance at Niles dispelled this thought in a flash. In the pale light of the high stars he was the embodiment of all possible human fear, quaking with an ague, his jaw fallen, his tongue out, his eyes protruding like those of a hanged man. Without a word we fled, the panic of fear giving us strength, and together the little dog caught close in Niles' arm. We sped down the side of the cursed mountains. Anywhere, goal was of no account. We had but one impulse, to get away from that place. So under the black trees and the far white stars that flashed through the still leaves overhead, we leaped down the mountainside, regardless of path or landmark, straight through the tangled underbrush, across mountain streams, through fens and copses, anywhere, so only that our course was downward. How long we ran thus, I have no idea. But by and by the forest fell behind, and we found ourselves among the foothills, and fell exhausted on the dry, short grass, panting like tired dogs. It was lighter here in the open, and presently we looked around to see where we were, and how we were to strike out in order to find the path that would lead home. We looked in vain for a familiar sign. Behind us rose the great wall of black forest on the flank of the mountain, before us lay the undulating mounds of low foothills unbroken by trees or rocks, and beyond only the fall of black sky bright with multitudinous stars that turned its velvet depths to a luminous gray. As I remember, we did not speak to each other once. The terror was too heavy on us for that. But by and by we rose simultaneously and started out across the hills. Still the same silence, the same 
dead and motionless air, the air that was at once sultry and chilling, a heavy heat struck through with an icy chill that felt almost like the burning of frozen steel. Still carrying the helpless dog, Niles pressed on through the hills and I followed close behind. At last, in front of us, rose a slope of moor touching the white stars. We climbed it wearily, reaching the top, and found ourselves gazing down into a great smooth valley filled halfway to the brim with... what? As far as the eye could see stretched a level plain of ashy white, faintly phosphorescent, a sea of velvet fog that lay like motionless water, or rather like a floor of alabaster, so dense did it appear, so seemingly capable of sustaining weight. If it were possible, I think that sea of dead white mist struck even greater terror in my soul than the heavy silence or the deadly cry. So ominous was it, so utterly unreal, so phantasmal, so impossible, as it lay there like a dead ocean under the steady stars. Yet through that mist we must go. There seemed no other way home, and, shattered with abject fear, mad with the one desire to get back, we started down the slopes to where the sea of milky mist ceased, sharp and distinct, around the stems of the rough grass. I put one foot into the ghostly fog. A chill, as of death, struck through me, stopping my heart, and I threw myself backwards on the slope. At that instant came again the shriek, close, close, right in our ears, in ourselves, and far out across that damnable sea I saw the cold fog lift like a water spout and toss itself high in writhing convolutions towards the sky. The stars began to grow dim as the thick vapor swept across them, and in the growing dark I saw a great watery moon lift itself slowly above the palpitating sea, vast and vague in the gathering mist. That was enough. We turned and fled along the margin of the white sea that throbbed now with fitful motion below us, rising, rising, slowly and steadily, driving us higher and higher up the side of the foothills. It was a race for life that we knew. How we kept it up, I cannot understand, but we did, and at last we saw the white sea fall behind us as we staggered up the end of the valley and then down into a region that we knew, and so on to the old path. The last thing I remember was hearing a strange voice, that of Niles, but horribly changed, stammer brokenly, The dog is dead. And then the whole world turned around twice, slowly and restlessly, and consciousness went out with a crash. It was some three weeks later, as I remember, that I awoke in my own room, and found my mother sitting beside the bed. I could not think very well at first, but as I slowly grew strong again, vague flashes of recollection began to come to me, and little by little the whole sequence of events of that awful night of the Dead Valley came back. All that I could gain from what was told me was that three weeks before I had been found in my own bed, raging sick, and that my illness grew fast into brain fever. I tried to speak of the dread things that had happened to me, but I saw at once that no one looked on them save as the hauntings of a dying frenzy, and so I closed my mouth and kept my own counsel. I must see Niles, however, and so I asked for him. My mother told me that he had been ill with a strange fever, but that he was now quite well again. Presently they brought him in, and when we were alone I began to speak to him of the night in the mountain. I shall never forget the shock that struck me down on my pillow when the boy denied everything, denied having gone with me, ever having heard the cry, having seen the valley, or feeling the deadly chill of the ghostly fog. Nothing would shake his determined ignorance, and in spite of myself I was forced to admit that his denials came from no policy of concealment, but from blank oblivion. My weakened brain was in a turmoil. Was it all but the floating phantasm of delirium? or had the horror of the real thing blotted Niles' mind into blackness so far as the events of the night and the dead valley were concerned. The latter explanation seemed the only one, else how explain the sudden illness which, in a night, had struck us both down? I said nothing more, either to Niles or to my own people, but waited with a growing determination that once well again I would find that valley if it really existed. It was some weeks before I was really well enough to go, but finally, late in September, I chose a bright, warm, still day, the last smile of the dying summer, and started early in the morning along the path that led to Hallsberg. I was sure I knew where the trail struck off to the right, 
down which we had come from the valley of dead water, for a great tree grew by the Halsberg path at the point where, with a sense of salvation, we had found the road home. Presently I saw it to the right, a little distance ahead. I think the bright sunlight and the clear air had worked as a tonic to me, for by the time I came to the foot of the great pine I had quite lost faith in the verity of the vision that haunted me, believing at last that it was indeed but the nightmare of madness. Nevertheless, I turned sharply to the right, at the base of the tree into a narrow path that led through a dense thicket. As I did so, I tripped over something. A swarm of flies sung into the air around me, and looking down I saw the matted fleece with the poor little bones thrusting through of the dog we had bought in Halsburg. Then my courage went out with a puff, and I knew that it all was true, and that now I was frightened. Pride and the desire for adventure urged me on, however, and I pressed into the close thicket that barred my way. The path was hardly visible, merely the worn road of some small beasts, for, though it showed in the crisp grasp, the bush grew thick and hardly penetrable. The land rose slowly, and rising grew clearer, until at last I came out on a great slope of hill, unbroken by trees or shrubs, very like my memory of that rise of land we topped, in order that we might find the dead valley and the icy fog. I looked at the sun. It was bright and clear, and all around insects were humming in the autumn air, and birds were darting to and fro. Surely there was no danger, not until after nightfall at least. So I began to whistle, and with a rush mounted the last crest of Brown Hill. There lay the dead valley, a great oval basin almost as smooth and regular as though made by man. On all sides the grass crept over the brink of the encircling hills, dusty green on the crests, then fading into ashy brown and so to a deadly white, this last color forming a thin ring running in a long line around the slope. And then nothing. Bare, brown, hard earth glittering with grains of alkali, but otherwise dead and barren. Not a tuft of grass, not a stick of brushwood, not even a stone, but only the vast expanse of beaten clay. In the midst of the basin, perhaps a mile and a half away, the level expanse was broken by a great dead tree rising leafless and gaunt into the air. Without a moment's hesitation, I started down into the valley and made for this goal. Every particle of fear seemed to have left me, and even the valley itself did not look so very terrifying. At all events, I was driven by an overwhelming curiosity, and there seemed to be but one thing in the world to do, to get to that tree. As I trudged along over the hard earth, I noticed that the multitudinous voices of birds and insects had died away. No bee or butterfly hovered through the air. No insects leapt or crept over the dull earth. The very air itself was stagnant. As I drew near the skeleton tree, I noted the glint of sunlight on a kind of white mound around its roots, and I wondered curiously. It was not until I had come close that I saw its nature. All around the roots and barkless trunk was heaped a wilderness of little bones, tiny skulls of rodents and of birds, thousands of them, rising about the dead tree and streaming off for several yards in all directions, until the dreadful pile ended in isolated skulls and scattered skeletons. Here and there a larger bone appeared, the thigh of a sheep, the hooves of a horse, and to one side, grinning slowly, a human skull. I stood quite still, staring with all my eyes, when suddenly the dense silence was broken by a faint, forlorn cry high over my head. I looked up and saw a great falcon turning and sailing downward just over the tree. In a moment more she fell motionless on the bleaching bones. Horror struck me, and I rushed for home, my brain whirling, a strange numbness growing in me. I ran steadily on and on. At last I glanced up. Where was the rise of the hill? I looked around wildly. Close before me was the dead tree with its pile of bones. I had circled it round and round, and the valley wall was still a mile and a half away. I stood there, dazed and frozen. The sun was sinking, red and dull, towards the line of hills in the east. The dark was growing fast. Was there still time? Time? It was not time that I wanted, it was will. My feet seemed clogged as in a nightmare. I could hardly drag them over the barren earth, and then I felt the slow chill creeping through me. I looked down. Out of the earth a thin mist was rising, collecting in little pools that grew ever larger, until they joined here and there, their currents swirling slowly like thin blue smoke. 
the western hills halved the copper sun. When it was dark, I should hear the shriek again, and then I should die. I knew that, and with every remaining atom of will, I staggered towards the red west through the writhing mist that crept clamily along my ankles, retarding my steps. As I fought my way off from the tree, the horror grew until at last I thought I was going to die. The silence pursued me like dumb ghosts. The still air held my breath. The hellish fog caught at my feet like cold hands. But I won, though not a moment too soon. As I crawled on my hands and knees up the brown slope, I heard, far away and high in the air, the cry that already had almost bereft me of reason. It was faint and vague, but unmistakable in its horrible intensity. I glanced behind. The fog was dense and pallid, heaving undulously up the brown slope. The sky was gold under the setting sun, but below was the ashy gray of death. I stood for a moment on the brink of this sea of hell, and then leapt down the slope. The sunset opened before me, the night closed behind, and as I crawled home, weak and tired, darkness shut down in the dead valley. This is the end of The Dead Valley by Ralph Adams Cram.